Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Forensic Frenzy's Idaho 4 series. As always, thank you for watching, and I appreciate all of your support. On November 25th, 2022, MPD asked area law enforcement agencies to be on the lookout for white Hyundai Elantras in the area. On November 29th, police officer Daniel, Daniel Tango, as a result of a query, located a 2015 white Elantra with Pennsylvania plate, LFZ 8649, registered to Brian Koberger, residing at 1630 Northeast Valley Road, apartment 201, Pullman, Washington. That same day at approximately 12.58 a.m., Officer Curtis Whitman was looking for white Hyundai Elantras and located a 2015 white Hyundai Elantra at the same apartment complex, an apartment complex that houses WSU students. Whitman also ran the car and it returned to Koberger with a Washington tag. I reviewed Koberger's Washington State driver's license information and photograph. He's a white male, height of six foot, 185 pounds, bushy eyebrows, physical description consistent with the description the male of the male that DM saw in the home. So my question is, were these officers looking for white Elantras for an issue on their own campus or in their own state and not as a result of that bolo? And I only ask because it took them three weeks to report this information to Moscow Police Department. Why the hesitation if it was pertaining to the BOLA? Or was this not pertaining to the BOLA? If indeed something did happen on or around November 29th that had Washington State University officers looking for a white Hyundai Elantra themselves, What would it have been? What could it have been? Why didn't this matter until December 20th of 2022? Part of your affidavit talks about WSU officers finding white elections. And I believe I, there was an officer that you had some communication with. Do you recall the date you had that communication? I do not recall the date. Um, did you have some messaging system exchange with this officer to talk about that? Yes, ma'am. Is that the only means of communication you had with this officer? No, ma'am. I believe I spoke to him on the telephone as well. When you spoke to him on the telephone, how did that relate to the date of the messaging? It would have likely been, if memory serves, it would likely have been that same day. Okay. Does December 20th, 2022 sound familiar to you? Yes, ma'am. Again, as you just heard, that information was not relayed to Brett Payne until December 20th, and it did not apparently come through the tip line. It came by phone call or text message. So let's recalibrate from December 20th and figure out what they knew. So they got a name and looked at his license. They got a description and decided it was consistent with the mail that DM saw. They got a vehicle identification, make, model, year, color, plates, old and new, as well as a registration address in Washington, likely at WSU. They also knew that he worked at WSU and likely that he had had those altercations at WSU as well. They knew the home address that he had put on file with WSU and that he had traveled, likely home to P Pennsylvania by way of Indiana and Colorado. They would have asked about traffic stops or incidences with police, and they would have found out about that stop in Washington on October 14th, 2022. And they also would have done their own due diligence to check into their own stops and found out about the August 21st stop in Moscow. That's where they got the phone number. They would have known the phone number and that the phone number was not on the tower dumps from 3 to 5 a.m. on November 13th. This is why I believe that whatever led law enforcement at WSU to be looking for the defendant 
on the 29th of November and querying his vehicle and going out to look for it at the apartments all within 30 minutes is related to what happened across state lines in Idaho. And I say this because there's almost nothing here that says, judge, you should sign a warrant so that I can get an expansion for 48 hours from November 12th at 12 a.m. to November 14th at 12 a.m. to figure out where this vehicle and this person and this phone were during those hours because he's not even on the tower deck. And at this point, they don't have any cast information. So there's a certain amount of information that they don't know. There's a certain amount of information that they can't say they used to get his phone warrants because it's the information that would have come from the phone warrants. And that's things like that the phone was off or out of service coverage from 2.47 to 4.48 a.m. They could have seen the vehicle heading south through Pullman at 2.47, but they wouldn't have known that the phone was off or out of service coverage. The phone may not have even been in the car at that point. They wouldn't know until they got the cast. They also don't seem to have known at that time until getting the cast about the alleged return to the crime scene at 9.12 a.m. on November 13th or the 12 prior visits to the area leading up to the events only to never return to the area ever again. So they can't back up the 48-hour warrant or the full six-month warrant with those things, because those are things that came from the warrants. Now, they can say that the 48 hour warrant led to something in the 48 hour warrant led to the six month warrant where they found the 12 visits prior to the area. But unfortunately, I'm confused as to what it was that ascertained enough probable cause to even get the very first warrant to get to the second warrant to find out about the 12 prior visits. So what led to the December 23rd warrants? What do you think it could have been? Could it have really been just the elements that we just discussed? How was probable cause established for that first warrant, that 48 hour warrant? Was it only the things that we initially discussed? These things. How does the phone not being on the tower dump equate to, we really need this 48 hour warrant? How did they know Enough, not no, but no enough. How did they know enough to get a judge to sign that 48 hour warrant? Was it something from the issue with Washington State University police officers on November 29th that coupled with these things to get that warrant? Or did something happen between November 29th and December 20th that really meshed for Washington State University police. We need to get that information about that man from November 29th across state lines to the Moscow Police Department. What do you think developed between the 29th of November and the 20th of December? How did we get to a place where there is enough probable cause to get that first AT&T warrant if Brian Koberger's phone was not on the tower dump? No. 
So when law enforcement gets that cast historical data on December 23rd, they go through it and they realize that at 2.42 a.m. the phone was at home, Brian's home. Then five minutes later, 2.47 a.m., it's leaving Brian's home and traveling south through Pullman. That's when they realize from the phone records that at that point it's either out of service area or turned off. Same story here at this portion of the PCA where they state that at 9 a.m. the phone is leaving the Coburger residence around 9 12 arriving to an area that would provide coverage to the King Road residence. It's staying there until around 9 21. 9 to 9 12 departure and arrival is 12 minutes. We've talked about this before. 921 departure from Moscow, 932 arrival back in Pullman is 11 minutes. We've talked about that before as well. So evidently, he is doing more than the legal speed limit or both times traveling with almost no traffic and not catching any lights, okay? I don't care about that. What I do care about is the number of minutes, okay? He can do this in 11 to 12 minutes. Now, I'm just going to throw this out there. You tell me what you make of it. Do you think that this could be the thing that happened that led law enforcement to realize this might be our guy and get a judge to sign that warrant? 11 to 12 minutes leaving his residence at 9, arriving at 9.12, leaving Moscow or the region of such near the King Road home at 9.21 and arriving back at his residence at 9.32, 11 to 12 minutes. Again, leaving his residence at 2.47 a.m. when the phone allegedly stops reporting to the network. Add 11 to 12 minutes. All right, guys. Did you do your math? 2.47 a.m. plus 11 to 12 minutes. 2.58 to 2.59 a.m. 2.58 and 30 seconds. Check me. This body cam image and the white car. Is this the white car investigators are looking for? So the body cam image that um, is out there from an officer who was on a call with the alcohol offense does have a white vehicle in it. This is not the vehicle that we are looking for. Um, so we want to clear that up with uh, all news media. I want you to know that when they said that, I believe that they actually thought that. And they thought that because they knew that this was not a 2011 to 2013. But they didn't know about the 2015 that they needed to be looking for for 12 more days. This body cam image and the white car, is this the white car investigators are looking for? So the body cam image that um, is out there from an officer who was on a call with the alcohol offense does have a white vehicle in it. This is not the vehicle that we are looking for. Um, so we want to clear that up with uh, all news media. Now, if that is a white 2015 Hyundai Elantra, arriving at approximately 2.58 and 30 seconds, exactly 11 minutes and 30 seconds after the white Hyundai Elantra allegedly leaves WSU, then perhaps law enforcement was wrong when they said this was not the vehicle. And they realized that 
the minute WSU called them and told them whatever they knew, whatever they thought they knew about the defendant. And then law enforcement realized what he drove. And then law enforcement realized that maybe that was the only reason they were negating this vehicle was because the ear didn't match. And perhaps this also played a role in getting the probable cause for those warrants. Perhaps they realized that exactly 11 minutes to 12 minutes after he left his home at 247, he did in fact arrive in the area of the King Road home while the police were in the area, which is exactly what they thought did not happen for sure when they put this out here for us to have publicly. Do you think that this may have tied into realizing the error of their ways and that they needed to expand the years of the vehicle that they were looking for or that Brian may actually be the person that they were looking for? Do you think this played a role in substantiating probable cause to get the 48 hour warrant? Because that is actually how they realized that this trip can in fact be done by the defendant and allegedly 11 to 12 minutes. So when they're looking at this body cam footage way back when it happened, they're like, this, this could be it. This could maybe not because it, then they're learning more and they're like, well, I arrived too soon. This isn't the car, but was it? Did they later learn that this trip can actually happen super fast by the defendant? And maybe that is also why they wanted us to know his the length of his travel time that morning and not just that he returned. Because truthfully, we don't really know the length of his travel time during the course of the events. But they provided that to us for the information relating to the next morning. And it fits in time perfectly to a T to be this vehicle passing on this body camera. So is it possible that this substantiated something? Is that the defendant's car or what the prosecution will allege to have been the defendant's car passing just now? Had he been in the area a little while longer than they told us, lingering around? And then just super quick before we go, I want to remind us that we do know what came from Brian Koberger's apartment and office on Washington State University campus. But we also have this order to seal for the entirety of Brian's case that was served to the Washington State University Office of the Registrar. WSU may have had their own reasons for looking into the defendant. And then something that they discovered led them to believe they needed to relay that information across state lines. And at that point, the defendant had already gone home for Christmas. What do you think Washington State University knows? What do you think led to the actual probable cause for the 48-hour warrant? Do you think it was something from November 29th that occurred on Washington State University? What do you believe happened here? What was the game changer?
could it be that that vehicle and the body cam footage was a 2015 white Hyundai Elantra? And it did ultimately end up being the vehicle that they were looking for? Let me know. As always, thank you for watching.